So some of us wanted to be doctors when we were growing up. Needless to say, we are not doctors, but some people did actually see it through and become doctors. Today, we're speaking to Dr. Stephanie Rausch, who is a UCT alumna and a junior doctor in KZN. I am Unati Kondile, the communications manager at the development and alumni department at UCT. Let's hear it from Steph. Steph, are you able to perhaps introduce yourself in a much more better way than I have done? Okay. Um, hi, my name is Steph Roach. Uh, I'm a junior doctor. I'm working at Manguzi Hospital in KwaZulu-Natal. Um, I work in all different fields now, but most of my time was in maternity this year. Um, and I'm very passionate about sexual and reproductive health and yeah, I spend a lot of my free time creating social media content and yeah, just learning more about sexual and reproductive health. And when did you graduate from UCT? In 2019. A straight medical degree or what, 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 what did you study towards? I actually, I started um, in social sciences. I wasn't sure what I wanted to do yet. Um, so I did psychology, economics, COSA, and what's the other one? Oh, stats. Um, <laughs> and then I decided after a few months that I was um, interested in medicine. So decided to change after that. Wow. Okay. And that's a M B C H B. Yes, that. Yeah. <laughs> and when did you graduate? Last. 2020, 20, 2019. 2019. So I did, yeah, I did my internship for two years at Stanger Hospital after that. And then now I'm doing my community service here at Manguzi Hospital. Okay, okay. All right, so we came across you through the KJB, the Klaus Jürgen uh, Fellowship, and also saw your Knickers in a Knot account. And we were quite interested in uh, a young doctor who's got an, a social media account uh, that seeks to help other young people, I assume. Um, so tell us more about this, the, 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 how we know you. <laughs> or what is Knickers in an Art? Let's start there. So I think it started in my final year of medicine in 2019. Um, I was getting a lot of questions from friends of mine about um, their own health, especially sexual and reproductive health, because I think people are embarrassed to speak to their um, doctors even, or to other friends, or to ask parents or siblings, even when it comes to sexual and reproductive health. So I was getting a lot of questions. Um, and the only reason I knew the answer is because I, it was because I studied medicine. And it just made me realize that there's such a small group of people that have access to reliable sexual health information. And the majority of the population doesn't have access to this information about how their own bodies work and what is normal and what is healthy. Um, and these, these friends who were asking me questions, they were people also at UCT. They also had like tertiary education and they still didn't have a basic knowledge about their own bodies, which made me realize that we're doing something very wrong in terms of our education and um, access to health information for young people. So I thought because so many people are asking the same questions, I thought, why don't I create a platform um, that answers some of the common questions? Mm -hmm. So before I started, I did a survey at my at well, firstly, my old school where I um, finished high school and then at a few other schools in Cape Town. And I asked high school students what questions they had about their own bodies and their own health. And a lot of people asked questions about um, sexual and reproductive health and different contraception. And then what also came up there was mental health. And people wanted to know what to do if you're feeling suicidal and they wanted to know about antidepressants and other psychotropic medication. So that's how, why uh, Nickerson and Art expanded to more than just sexual health. Um, so it was based on those responses to surveys and what my friends had asked me. Um, and I wanted to, it to be something that young people use. And yeah, I just felt like a lot of high school students and young adults who who are out of high school use Instagram. So yeah, that's where it started. Which high school did you go to? I was at Springfield Convent, <laughs> so obviously didn't get a lot of sexual health at a religious <laughs> school. And there were no problems when you went back with a survey of this nature 
We went no, back to yeah. everyone's very open-minded now. Um, yeah, they were very welcoming and encouraging. Okay. And then in terms of the content that's there, I think I was just going through it. I saw, you know, um, especially on mental health, there was something about um, a large part of this is not medication, it's the therapy part of it. Um, how, what has the response been like towards the mental health component? I think overall the feedback has been so positive. Mm. I think that when people hear um, that there's different options available to them, I think they feel very excited because people are afraid of medication. Um, and I think just knowing that there's evidence-based interventions also makes feel, people feel very hopeful. Um, mm. Because I think when you hear vague information about what's going to help you, you, I don't know, sometimes you don't feel that you're going to get better. But when you hear that things like psychotherapy, even mindfulness and medications, all of these things have randomized control trials that have sh been shown um, to work, I think it gives people a lot of hope when they're feeling low. Um, so yeah, and we've had a lot of people message to say thank you um, for the information that they've received. Um, yeah, so it's been very positive. Are you planning to go onto other social media websites like Facebook or Twitter or is it just Instagram? Um, I think at the moment uh, my community service here has been very busy. Yeah. <laughs> so I haven't had a chance even to post as often as I would like. But I think in the future, maybe next year, um, after I've finished my community service, then I'll be able to broaden um, the platforms I use. But for now, because Instagram is what most people I know were using, um, yeah. Okay. And then let's just take that another notch higher. Career-wise, if you were now to guide a young person to be the next step, how would you, what would you recommend if they want to be a doctor? Um, how would you talk to this person? <laughs> I think before you decide on medicine, I think you need to think about it very hard. Um, I think it's, it's a lot more challenging than I expected. I think um, that we not, I think that in some ways we're not prepared um, for what real South Africa is like. Um, working in a rural healthcare setting where you're isolated from your family and your friends is very difficult. Um, and working in a system where you can do, you can work, you can work so hard and you can still not be able to provide the care you want for your patient um, because of a lack of resources. I think that can be very demoralizing. Um, so I think if people want to do medicine, I think they must go into it knowing that it's going to be hard. Yeah. And I think if you start your career knowing that these challenges are going to be there, then you'll reach out early. So I think if you create a good support system, if you make sure you're seeing a counsellor or psychologist, um, if you ensure that you have yeah, just a, a really good support system in place, I think you can manage. Um, but I think that a lot of young doctors are struggling now because they weren't prepared for how difficult it would be. Um, especially working in rural healthcare, especially being isolated from their friends and family in internship and community service. So the um, internship component, you don't choose that. So you, you do this for six years, right? So you study for six years. Yes, that's the degree. And afterwards, there's two years internship. Yes. And, and then one year you... community service. Okay. Okay. So that's but nine years total. Yes, in terms of oh, wow. yeah. okay. Um, and then so okay, going back to university now, what made your life easier um while you were studying at UCT? I I think firstly social support. I think I had a lot of amazing colleagues, um, well, a fellow students at the time. I was re very grateful to have a strong support system. And I also was surrounded by people who very much believed in mental health care. So I think if you're around friends who can openly speak about the fact that they're seeing a psychologist or that they're taking medication, it makes you feel safe and encourages you to do the same. So I think that was incredibly powerful for me. 
And also UCT was very pro mental health. So I was constantly reminded that there was um, student wellness available. There were also people available just for medical students. Um, and I think just having that atmosphere helps a lot. But even then, there's still a lot of stigma. Like I think everyone was trying very hard, but it's decades of stigma that we're trying to break through at the moment still. Yeah. And so what do you think helped? I know that there's the Klaus, the KJP. How, how did you get into that program actually? So I heard about um, this leadership program that was available. Um, and yeah, I just, when I read about it, it just sounded like a great way to meet other people who are interested in leadership outside of medicine. Um, and I think that when you are in the Faculty of Health Sciences, your exposure can be quite narrow, like you're only really exposed to medical personnel. Um, and I thought it would be amazing to work with people outside of um, health sciences. Um, so I, yeah, I interviewed and I was very lucky to find out that I had received the scholarship. And after that, um, we there were there have been multiple workshops available um, and we had I think because of COVID, there were probably less events, um, but we met up a few times in person before while I was still a student at UCT. Um, and yeah, it was just, it was amazing to listen to other people's stories who are outside of medicine to give you more perspective. Um, yeah. Okay. And other initiatives. Okay. And Nickerson and Ott, they didn't support that. Oh, how was that supported? Or no, definitely. So they, it, KJV loves to keep in contact with everyone and ch yeah, check up and what everyone's up to. Yeah. And um, they always ask us what kind of projects we're involved with. So I explained that I was starting Nickers in the Art. Um, <laughs> and they have shared the, the page so that other KJB alumni um, can follow and share as well. Yeah. And we're actually, we're starting a new mental health care project um, at the moment, which is, they said it partly inspired by Nickers and Anat, but I think it's much bigger than that. I definitely won't take credit for that. But it's also going to be something similar, um, but mainly focused on mental health. Um, but yeah, we'll update you as it comes out, but it's still in the beginning stages. Um, and it's more focused um, on sharing people's stories on social media, but also artwork and kind of a broader interpretation um, of mental well-being. Um, yeah, and people sharing their experiences and stories, especially after COVID. Okay. And it's not the doctor's retreat. There's also the doctor's retreat that you started. Tell us yeah, so about that. Something so <laughs> so yeah. that's something a little bit separate. Um, I think, so my main passions have always been sexual and reproductive health and then mental health. Mm. Um, I think I love anything to do with health that people think is difficult to talk about. I want to go there and I want to talk about it. Yeah. Um, I was really interested in um, mental health the past few years. Um, just in my own life, I've had my own experiences of mental illness and lots and lots of colleagues. And I'm sure everyone knows suicide is obviously... Um, huge in all communities, but especially amongst medical professionals. And as I met with um, fellow medical professionals during my internship, what we realized is one of the things that really helped us was just sitting together and also spending time moving our bodies. So I think going to yoga um, with some of the other doctors made me just realize that mental illness and interventions for mental illness is so much more than just medication. And we would have really hard weeks and be feel so overwhelmed and feel like our whole lives were about um, patients. And then we would go to yoga on a Wednesday evening and we would afterwards, we would just feel like so much more contained and more whole. And just using like something so simple like yoga as a physical intervention would just it just felt like it had such huge um effects on our mental well-being and just entering that space with fellow fellow medical professionals also just felt very impactful and then we thought why don't we make this a formal event for doctors so um i asked anesu mbizvo i'm not sure if you know her she's amazing she actually was a doctor as well. Yeah. And she decided that she rather wanted to be um, involved in health 
in a broader sense. And she started a yoga studio in uh, Joburg um, and just actually a wellness space, not just yoga. Um, and so she agreed to uh, create the retreat uh, or basically facilitate the retreat with us. And over a weekend, we spent time doing reflection. We did a lot of yoga and movement. We went on walks. And I think, um, yeah, it was just so amazing to be in a space where everyone there has given up a whole weekend, which is really valuable when a lot of your weekends you spend working. Mm. So a group of people who had committed to a weekend away just to work on themselves and to give back to themselves and to yeah try and find a way of connecting and supporting each other. Um, and yeah, it was it was really, really special. And I because I'm now very far from a lot of places, I haven't been able to have a repeat one this year, but I'm hoping when I'm closer to Cape Town in the future, we'll be able to run more retreats because it was really powerful to share that space with mm. other doctors and to watch doctors just giving back to themselves because it's so rare. Okay. Speaking of like safe spaces and like places where you feel relaxed, Back to UCT, where were you most comfortable? Like that one spot you really remember or like what was your happy spot here at UCT? <laughs> I think I have a lot of good memories uh, from just the quad in med school. <laughs> I think <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we didn't spend enough time on upper campus, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, yeah, but I think it's even just being outdoors with people that are important to you. I think it really impacts your mental health. Um, but yeah, I had a lot of good times there. And also in uh, Grassi's inside of Kritiskia Hospital. Um, <laughs> apparently it's much nicer now. They've revamped it. Yeah. But it's so special to share a meal with people and, I don't know, to just debrief and yeah, spend time being a human being and not being a doctor for the 30 minutes that you get in the day. Are there any academics that still stand out that you still remember that played a particular influence? Uh, I think um, clinical skills, um, it was it was obviously more interactive. It's yeah, clinical work, but we had a really good support system. The people who facilitated clinical skills were really supportive and encouraging, and they would they would actually speak about mental health as well during the sessions. Um, and that was more like teamwork, interactive with other class members. And then also, I've, well, I've always loved reproductive health, but our ops and gynae department was also amazing. And instead of just following like a strict medical curriculum, they included things like um, comprehensive sexual health and gender identity and they spoke much more about sexual health than just contraception which was really amazing um mm. and yeah even mental health and just like uh, everything that students is uh, that i think is important to students obs and gynae chose to cover yeah. <laughs> um, yeah so now you're in kzn culturally sexual health and all these things you're talking about <laughs> Very difficult to, how, how are you addressing that in a rural setting, like with a traditional Zulu man who comes in and, or a, a, an old mama who will not discuss such things or name them or use the words that you want them to use? How, how are you dealing with that? I think that actually everywhere you go, it's the same issues and it's just that oh. so many people are afraid. No, I think it, I really think that it's a pervasive issue. Um, like whether from being in Cape Town to being in Stanga to now being in Manguzi, mm. I really don't think I've noticed a difference. What I find is that in general, maybe people struggle to speak about these things. But when you're sitting with someone one on one, everyone wants to talk about their sexual health and people are so empowered when you ask them the questions. And so they don't they know that you are comfortable as well. Mm. So I, I really think that everyone wants to feel that there's a safe space when they meet that their healthcare worker that they have a safe space to talk about these issues because everyone struggles with sexually transmitted infections so many people ex suffer from hiv and aids so many people struggle with infertility from every background and there's stigma from every background um even yeah just contraception everyone wants to know 
mm. about their own body. And when you ask those questions and you open it up, there's so much that comes out and people are so grateful that you've asked the question and they don't have to ask it. Okay. Um, and yeah. just uh, in language, I know that at, at UCT they also offered COSA as a course. <laughs> Have you found that useful for you? We saw a report recently saying it doesn't really help because the language, you know, it isn't as deep or nuanced. Um, have you found the, that that taking that course helped a bit? Yeah, to be honest, I think, I don't think it did help a lot. I actually did a study with um, one of my uh, fellow students, Zakra Mohammed, in I think it was our fifth year that yeah. basically just showed that people don't find that um, the language tuition that they receive um, at medical school is translating into language abilities um, in a clinical setting. And what I think we were missing there is definitely immersion, because since moving to KZN, my Zulu is my, it's like I can, I can manage. My Zulu is so much better than when I started. Yeah. And it's just because if you are with Zulu patients, you speak Zulu, you have no choice. Um, and you have a responsibility as a healthcare worker to communicate with your patients and to learn the language that they speak. Um, so I think it it really, it didn't help a lot learning just like on paper, yeah, but being yeah. with patients and being immersed in a language, I think makes a huge difference. Okay, no, that makes a lot of sense. Okay, and then just finally, is there anything that perhaps you had in mind or wanted to share that I didn't ask? <laughs> no, I think that UCT just gave me such a, um, a deep sense of wanting to do better. And I think that I came from a very academic environment um, at UCT where we were just, we were pushed to, to challenge what we were being taught and to challenge systems that were in place and to talk about things that people, that made people uncomfortable and to talk about things that people were afraid to talk about. And I think that grow, like I came from a, a background where I went to a religious school. Um, I have a religious family. And when I went to UCT, I realized that actually it's okay to challenge all of the things that you've been brought up. Um, no, well, what you thought you knew. And yeah, UCT really encouraged me to challenge all of my beliefs and to really open my mind, especially in terms of sexual and reproductive health, which I knew hardly anything about before I started. So yeah, I think that ethos from UCT is something that I really hold on to now. Um, and I think, yeah, just to not shy away from things that you that make people uncomfortable. Um, and sexual and reproductive health really does make some people uncomfortable. But when you speak to individuals, it's so important to people and it really changes people's lives if you engage with that. So yeah, I'm so, I really am so proud to be um, a UCT graduate um, and, yeah, I just think that the way that we approach things now, when I compare myself to other doctors, I really feel so proud of the way um, that UC gradu UCT graduates work. And even the approach to patients um, is just so open-minded, especially in terms of sexuality. I think, yeah, I feel really, really proud to be a UCT doctor. <laughs> uh, no, thank you. Just lastly, just as a thought, do you think the social sciences background, that start, do you think that made a difference in who you are as a doctor today? And how so? Definitely. Uh, I think um, if, you, if you just do health sciences, I think your world can seem very small. But even just from one year of um, exposure to psychology, politics, economics, really just ingrained in me is that the world is not just medicine and your career is not just medicine. It's much bigger than that. Um, and also just meeting people from a, like a, so many different backgrounds and people who just think differently because a lot of medical students are very type A personalities. And it was just, it was so good to spend time with people whose minds are broader, I suppose, than mine. So yeah, I learned a lot from me and I met yeah a lot of different people um, and yeah, just, it was just a good reminder from the beginning that the world is a lot bigger than Western medicine. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. So it's tough being a doctor. Yeah. <laughs>
That's today's episode on the UCT Alumni Conversation Series. Uh, catch you on the next episode. Thank you.